Good morning. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, we are here today to talk about the serious effects of, mental, of marijuana on mental health. We are joined here today by uh, Charles Curry, Administrator of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, Professor Neil McKegney from the University of Glasgow in Glasgow, Scotland, who is the founding director of the Center for Drug Misuse Research within the university, and who has concentrated on research within drug misuse field for the last 15 years. Uh, Tanya and Ernest Skaggs, our parents, who will share their personal story with us a little bit later. We'll thank them especially for being here in circumstances. Dr. Richard Chesinski uh, is uh, from the American Pediatric Association Council on Addiction Psychiatry. And Dr. Bob DuPont is president of the Institute of Behavioral Health and a practical psychiatrist and clinical professor of psychiatry at Georgetown University. I want to thank each of these people for being here and uh, for being a partner in this effort. We are communicating the important message that marijuana can be dangerous for our children's mental health. My office is focused on preventing drug use and marijuana use in particular. Our job is to tell parents facts about marijuana that they may not know and that the information about marijuana that they may think they know is out of date. Today we are especially worried about the growing and compelling evidence from researchers around the world that regular marijuana use can contribute to depression, suicidal thoughts, and schizophrenia. Marijuana is, most commonly is the most commonly used illegal drug in the United States. Marijuana is being used by our children at younger ages. From the recent research, we know that the age of first use is a critical risk factor in the development of mental health problems associated with marijuana. The younger our children are when they start smoking marijuana, the more likely they will have mental health problems later in life. We are so serious about this issue that next week we are running an open letter to parents in more than 30 newspapers and magazines around the country. You see copies of uh, that letter here to warn citizens, parents, especially about the marijuana's danger to teens' mental health. The letter is signed by my office, the Office of National Drug Control Policy, and 12 of the nation's leading mental health, behavioral health, and addiction treatment organizations. They include the American Psychiatric Association, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, Asian Community Mental Health Services, the Association for Medical Research and Research in Substance Abuse, Institute for Behavioral and Health, Be Behavior and Health Incorporated, the National Asian American Pacific Islander Mental Health Association, the National Association of Addiction Treatment Providers, the National Association for Communi Community Behavioral <coughs> Health, the National Latino Behavioral Health Association, the National Medical Association, and the Partnership for Drug Free America. I am pleased that representatives from a number of these groups have been able to join us today. I want to thank them and I want to thank all these groups for helping us get out this important information. I would now like to introduce Charles Curry, my partner and administrator for the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Thank you, John, and thank you especially for your leadership today on this very important issue. And I am pleased to very much join you in this distinguished panel, uh, Neil and uh, Richard, my good friend Bob DuPont, and especially uh, Tanya and Ernest Skaggs. Thank you for being here today to share your story, your life, and bring to life the challenges we face as policymakers as well as as parents. As with everyone else in this room this morning, I'm willing to guess that most of us didn't just wake up one day and choose to champion causes related to addiction and mental illness. Instead, we woke up one day and either through a call to public service, through our work, or through countless other avenues, a loved one's suicide or a friend's overdose, we have discovered that it has chosen us and we have made a commitment to help. I'd also like to take a moment to thank all the leaders in the substance abuse prevention, addiction treatment, and mental health services field who are here today and have made a commitment to help. I know that the President and all of us at SAMHSA appreciate your support and hard work it's an honor to work with in partnership with uh, Director John Walters. It's an honor to serve a president who also knows that prevention works, treatment works, and recovery is real. We at SAMHSA are working to help more Americans who struggle with addiction and mental illness have an opportunity to live, work, learn, and enjoy healthy lives in the communities across the country. One of our greatest challenges 
and that is why I've made it a priority at SAMHSA is co-occurring substance use and mental disorders. We know more today about the illness than ever before. However, we still have a tendency to want to put people into disease categories that are often created by funding streams. However, when it comes to substance use and mental illness, these two disorders very often co-occur and must be treated accordingly. Casting a very broad net, our latest treatment improvement protocol, or TIP, on treating co-occurring disorders presents data showing that 50 to 75 percent of patients in substance abuse treatment programs have co-occurring mental illness, while 25 to 50 percent of those treated in mental health settings have co-occurring substance abuse. But very few patients are ever treated for both disorders. SAMHSA's goal is to ensure that patients seeking treatment no matter where they enter the system, substance abuse treatment center, mental health facility, medical clinic, are provided with the opportunity for treatment of both their disorders and the opportunity for recovery so they may have a meaningful, connected life to the community. If one of the co-occurring disorders remains untreated, usually both get worse. Additional complications often arise, including the risk for other medical problems, suicide, unemployment, homelessness, incarceration, and separation from families and friends. According to SAMHSA's National Survey on Drug Use and Health, known as the Household Survey, in 2003 there were approximately 4 million Americans with co-occurring disorders. This number reflects those people who had a co-occurring serious substance use disorder and a serious mental illness. We know that if we are to include less severe mental illnesses and substance use problems, the number of Americans with co-occurring disorders would be much higher. For example, a new report that we are releasing today shows that adults who first used marijuana before age 12 were twice as likely to be classified as having a serious mental illness in the past year than were adults who first used marijuana at age 18 or older. The research points to an association between early marijuana use and a heightened risk of developing serious mental illness that also may go untreated. And it goes without saying that people with co-occurring disorders cannot separate their drug problem from their mental disorder and certainly should not have to negotiate separate service delivery systems for treatment. Unfortunately, many long-standing systemic barriers to appropriate treatment support services remain in place. To begin to eliminate these barriers, we've created a new state incentive grant for co-occurring disorders. Eleven states have applied to re have received these grants among 40 that applied. We also established a co-occurring center for excellence, a national co-occurring disorders prevention and treatment technical assistant and cross-training center to help programs and providers across the nation who want to provide services to those with co-occurring disorders. We also have made much progress, but we also need to recognize our work is far from over. And to build on, the, on this progress in reducing drug use among youth, SAMHSA awarded strategic prevention framework grants to 19 states and two territories to advance community-based programs for substance abuse prevention, mental health promotion, and mental illness addressing all three together. The success of the framework rests in large part on the tremendous work that comes from grassroots community anti-coalitions, anti-drug coalitions and parents. After all, we've said it time and time again, the most important wor work to reduce drug use is done in America's living rooms and classrooms, in churches and synagogues, in the workplace and in our neighborhoods. Families, schools, communities and faith-based organizations shape the character of young people. They teach children right from wrong, respect for the law, and most importantly, respect for themselves. I believe by keeping our national attention, energy, and resources focused, focused on reducing marijuana use among youth, focused on raising that age of initiation, we can and will continue to make progress and ultimately achieve the President's goals for reducing substance abuse in America. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Neil McKegney. I'm Professor of Drug Misuse Research at the University of Glasgow, where for the last 20 years I've been carrying out research on various aspects of uh, uh, drug-related problems. Um, I'm here today as a researcher, but I'm not going to quote a series of statistics for you. But it is clear over the years that I've been carrying out research that marijuana, what we call cannabis, has a huge negative impact on the lives of many young people. Um, it's a drug which is perceived as having very little adverse impact. It's often attached to the term recreational use 
to imply somehow that it is almost positive uh, impact on young people's lives. And that is a, an impression which I think is oddly shared by many people, uh, academic researchers, practitioners, young people, some politicians, and many others. It's a view, however, which is seriously being revised now in the light of recent research evidence. It's odd in a way that cannabis is the drug, marijuana is the drug that's most widely used, but actually there has not been as much research on that drug as one would expect. There's been a great deal of attention on heroin and cocaine, much less on marijuana. But the most recent research that has been carried out on mar marijuana is, I think, shocking for many people because it is leading us to look again at this so-called recreational drug. And we are seeing on the basis of those research studies, firstly, that kids who start to use marijuana at a young age, at young age are much more likely to se experience serious long-term mental health problems. They're very likely to start to use other illegal drugs as well. The gateway thesis is clearly occurring. Nearly everyone who's used heroin and cocaine has also used marijuana, and we are seeing that in the case of young people too. Um, we, we know that whilst there is some evidence that people use marijuana to self-medicate, that in many instances the, the mental illness uh, that they experience uh, comes after their use of marijuana. There are the, the idea that, there, that the people who are using marijuana have mental health problems prior to their marijuana use, and that is the explanation for the association which uh, we are increasingly seeing now is, is being shown to be not the case. Some individuals that will be true, but for many individuals their mental health problems are arising as a result of, not prior to, their, their marijuana use. And I think that that too is really important. The, the, the second thing I'd like to say is that on the basis of research which I and colleagues have carried out, looking particularly at kids who don't use illegal drugs, and I think that that is an important focus, we've asked them, how is it that in situations where they are not using illegal drug use, what, what has protected them? Now, one of the things that they have spoken about uh, consistently is the messages that come from their parents, the, the standards that their parents set, the openness of communication between parents and young people about the topic of illegal drugs. Now, that underlines to me the importance of the open letter which is, be, which is being circulated uh, later, because it, 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 it encourages parents to address an issue of illegal drug use, which many parents, I think, are, are fearful of and reluctant to do and often don't engage with young people or, or on, on that subject. Now, the indications from research, too, is that that is a costly, that is a costly view to have, that we, ha we have to have open and honest communications with young people about the topic of illegal drug with the aspiration of stopping the likelihood of young people going on to use illegal drugs. Because the indications, as I said, are is that not everyone who uses marijuana or cannabis will go on to progress to other illegal drugs, but many of them will. And those who only use marijuana, some of those will go on to experience serious adverse mental health problems. So it's for those two reasons that I've travelled from Glasgow to this press conference, because I am fully supportive of the initiative that the administration has, is announcing today. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Tanya Skaggs, and this is my husband, Ernest. We lost our 15-year-old son, Christopher, to suicide on July 13th of 2004. This is his picture. He hung himself in our home. It's been very devastating to our family. In January of 2004, we had discovered that Christopher was smoking marijuana. He was caught smoking it behind his school with five other kids. We were devastated. We really did not know what to do. We immediately wanted him to be able to just stop. We wanted to get him clean. We felt like that would, that would be the best thing for us to do. We talked with him about our disapproval of the use of the drugs. We started searching his room regularly. We did random drug tests on him. And we went into counseling with him. We thought we were doing the right things. While we were in counseling with him, 
we had discovered that what we thought were just typical teenage mood swings were actually a form of mild depression. But because he had been using marijuana, this was making the depression worse. And as we were, it was explained to us by the counselor, he started using because he was feeling bad. He would feel temporarily better, but then it'd bring him back down and he'd have to use again. So it was a very hard cycle for it to us to break. Like I said, we were naive. We didn't really know some of the warning signs. Christopher was picked up every day from school, never smelt anything. That's kind of things that we thought. He had an acne problem that we just thought was just normal. Come to find out that was one of the signs. Christopher was a wonderful kid. He was an athlete. He was really popular, and he did volunteer work. We just didn't think something like this would happen to our family, but it did. When, in April of 2004, Christopher was helping one of his friends who was in trouble with the law run away. They were both 15 and had no licenses and were driving across three states. In pursuit from the law, they ended up into a rollover wreck. They were not hurt, and we were thankful for that. I'm telling you the story to let you know that he had a severe lack of judgment, which we believe was because of the marijuana. This destructive behavior was continuing, and we were at the end of our ropes. We really did not know what to do next. So we just sat down with him and asked him, what can we do to help you? Because we have done all the things that we thought would help, and it's not. He suggested to us that he would like to get away for a while and go to New Mexico with our family for a couple months during the summer to work, clear his head. We felt like that was a good idea. We can get him away from some negative influences and put him around positive influences. So we let him go. While he was there, he did wonderfully. He had a really good time, and he seemed to just be back to the old Chris that we knew. Two months later, he came home. Everything was great. He was very excited about starting high school. He was going to be a freshman, about getting his driver's license, and just about starting football, because he was an amazing athlete. <laughs> and eight days later, he was dead. We saw no clues to this, no warning signs. We wish we'd have had that. We wish we would have known the signs of the drug use. So we could have found out the underlying problem as to why he was using marijuana in the first place. I wish we would have done that. I wish we would have dug deeper to find out what was going on in his head. Some of our advice to parents would be to just communicate with your children and do it effectively. Set a certain side, time aside where there's no interruptions and let them know that this is a safe place to talk with you about anything to know who their friends are and how involved they are in their lives. To look into why the drugs were used in the first place because there's an underlying problem. And don't be ashamed to ask for help. You need to seek it out. You cannot do this alone. Trust your instincts. If you believe that there's more going on, then there probably is. Keep digging until you find out. You may lose their trust, but they lost yours. So don't be afraid to continue to do that. And we want parents to know that this is a very dangerous drug. We were a typical family with a typical teenager. We have three other children who we've all been affected by. This has devastated our family and it's changed our whole dynamics and questioned our parenting skills. We just never thought something like this could happen to us. But it does and it did. And we're just left with wonderful memories of somebody that we wish we could have helped and he could have trusted us enough to come and help him. Thank you. Uh, I'm Richard Sushinsky, and I'm here representing the American Psychiatric Association. I wish I could tell you that the Skagg story is an unusual one, but unfortunately it's not, and it's one that we hear very frequently as a result of uh, drug use and uh, other emotional illnesses. I appreciate the opportunity of being here today to talk with you about marijuana and mental illness. Uh, the American Psychiatric Association has issued a prior position statement on psychoactive uh, substance use and dependence. 
uh, which states that uh, the evidence has accumulated over the past decade that uh, there is a significant association between psychopathology and substance abuse. In some instances, <laughs> substance abuse has resulted from psychopathology, and in other instances, it has been the cause of it. In addition to exposing themselves to the risks of drug use, like automobile accidents, overdose, or impaired physical, emotional, and psychological development, adolescents are establishing attitudes towards and actual patterns of use that have profound long-term consequences on health. We need to be vigilant about protecting children from using illegal drugs such as marijuana and noting signs and symptoms of developing disorders. We need to help our young people lead healthy, productive, meaningful lives free of drugs and free of psychopathology. Since May is Mental Health Month, the American Psychiatric Association is launching a national public information campaign to improve public awareness of mental illness and mental health issues, especially those common to uh, adolescents. The stigma associated with mental illness needs to be addressed and eradicated. Uh, I personally think that the stigma issue is probably one of the most important ones that uh, we need to address. Uh, the stigma has, the issue has to be addressed so that adolescents and, adult, and adults alike can feel comfortable seeking information and treatment. <coughs> Parents and adolescents should be aware and vigilant in looking for signs and symptoms of mental illness, and they should also know that seeking help is a sign of strength. Many useful and informative tools exist for identifying signs and symptoms of mental illness, as well as information on how to cope with these issues including the American Psychiatric Association's new consumer site, uh, www.healthyminds.org. Psychiatrists across the nation are committed to providing leadership in educating the public about drug abuse and how it is both a cause and consequence of emotional problems. Thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to responding to any questions you may have as appropriate when, uh, when this uh, conference is over. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a privilege for me to be here. I want to begin by thanking uh, John Walters for his leadership from the White House office on this issue and, and so many other issues. He's done an outstanding job of bringing the problems of drug abuse and the goal of drug abuse prevention uh, to the American people. And I also want to thank President Bush uh, for his leadership and uh, the courage uh, he has shown in setting as his goal for his term as president uh, the dramatic reduction of drug use in the United States. Uh, he set, set the goal of, of reducing it by 10% uh, uh, within two years and 25% uh, within five years. Uh, that kind of numerical uh, goal uh, shows real courage and the fact that uh, we are making progress toward that goal uh, shows the work that, that is being uh, done. Now, my background, I'm a practicing psychiatrist. I am, as you heard, a professor of, uh, clinical professor of psychiatry at Georgetown, and I was uh, the second White House drug czar, uh, serving under Presidents Nixon and Ford, and was the first director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. I have grown up with the mental health issues and the drug abuse issues in all of my uh, professional life. I, I want to recall for you, because my topic is to talk about parents, that there was a time, a time of think of almost like Camelot, uh, when the parents in this country took the leadership in the drug abuse issue in the late 1970s and early 1980s, uh, and literally changed the scene in America about drugs. This was called uh, the Parents' Movement, and I just want to show you here the, the book that was the Bible of the Parents' Movement. You heard the mention of the term gateway drugs. This is a book called Gateway Drugs, A Guide for the Family, published by the American Psychiatric Association uh, in 1984, and was very much part of that. I'm proud to say also I was the author of the book, and uh, it was it had a forward by Ann Landers, which I'm also proud of. Uh, but that movement uh, really changed the face of drug abuse in the United States with dramatic reductions in, in use of drugs, and it focused on marijuana. Now, I want to come back to a very simple point, and that is that the goal here is to discourage, reduce, and ultimately stop youth drug use 
youth using illegal drugs to move the year, the age, when youth make decisions about using drugs or not, from early teenage, where it's being made now by many youth, into adulthood. And that to achieve that is primarily a responsibility of adults, uh, parents, teachers, doctors, other physicians, others, uh, to have clear understanding of that goal and to move forcefully uh, toward uh, achieving that goal. The one thing we have learned about what discourages youth drug use is the perception of risk. When young people perceive great risk associated with using illegal drugs, they are far less likely to use. And this perception of risk is a reflection of a societal belief system that you've heard some about here this morning. One key aspect of that risk is what we're talking about here now. And this press conference and, and these o open letters that are being published are historic in focusing on the risk of mental illness as a significant risk for youth drug use. And you will notice that it focuses on early initiation of the drug use is where the risk is particularly concentrated. And that reinforces the goal, the societal goal of delaying the age at which that choice is made uh, to later years. Now let me say a word about parents and the role of parents in drug abuse prevention. The Skag story is a, a tragic story and one uh, is, that is by no means uncommon. Having worked for years in treating uh, drug addicts, uh, I can tell you that it is a very uh, serious, often a lifelong uh, disease, and it's not a problem that is usually, in any event, easily solved or quickly solved, uh, but goes on for a long time and ha often has uh, a, a, a terrible outcome, including, as you heard, with Chris Skagg's uh, death and the implications for, for the whole family and the community are, are profound. Uh, in that. What parents can do, the most important thing, is to understand, be close to their kids, know what's going on with their kids, and get across the message that we, we, your parents, we, the adults in your life, including teachers and others, don't want you to use illegal drugs. This is a mistake. It's unhealthy. It's dangerous. It's wrong. It's illegal. And to make that message clear and convincing, and to help the young people understand that this is not made out of some desire to deprive them of having fun or to limit uh, their growth and their, their, their uh, activities as youth, but the exact opposite, that it is made out of love, out of concern, out of compassion, uh, out of a sense of the vulnerability that young people have to drug use. And, and all the studies of later drug addicts, again, confirm that it's this early use that is particularly uh, menacing in terms of the prognosis. So what we're talking about here that is historic is bringing in concern about mental illness into the equation about the prevention of youth drug use and saying this is one more very, very serious, important reason for kids not to use drugs and for parents and other adults who are concerned about kids to make sure that kids don't use drugs. And as you heard from the Skaggs, the second message for parents is this. You're not alone. If you have a problem, and many good parents with good parenting skills have serious drug problems in their families, does not mean that there's something defective in the family to have a drug problem. Get help. Do what needs to be done. You are not alone, in particular working with other families who are facing these problems is very important. And the secret weapon in the war on drugs is the 12-step programs. Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, and for family members, uh, uh, Al-Anon. Go to Al-Anon meetings. You will, parents, go to Al-Anon you will find in Al-Anon a community of families who are dealing with this problem, who know about the community resources that are available to you and can help you use them. Thank you very much.